today we are fortunate to have Tani Chan. Um, Tani Chan um, is a lawyer. He counsels clients in patent prosecution in a wide variety of areas, including batteries and fuel cells and drug delivery, nanotechnology, chemical processes, biomolecular engineering, and analytical devices. He has a particular focus on startups and university work and has helped companies develop strong IP protections based on their business goals and potential threats from competitors. He received his doctorate in chemical engineering from MIT in 1999 and spent two years as a postdoctoral research fellow at the Center for Engineering in Medicine at Harvard Medical School, Mass General Hospital. He started working at Wolf Greenfield in 2001 and received his law degree from Suffolk in 2006. In addition, Tenny has been active in several business competitions, including mentoring teams and providing office tours. The floor is yours, Tan. Thanks, Mehmet. Um, so today we're gonna to talk about uh, patents. Um, this is probably not your typical patent talk um, that, that, that focuses on, on the ins and outs of patenting and, and that sort of thing. It's really more of a discussion on strategic concerns and, and how other people look at patents. Um, in the ecosystem and how it kind of flows from being something that's in the lab to something that that becomes commercially interesting and, and maybe the foundation of a company or something like that. Um, so that's why this is sort of ent entitled, uh, you know, advanced IP topics. It's actually a little bit more advanced than, than what you might be used to. Um, whoops. So this is a little bit about my background as Mehmet me mentioned. Um, been at Wolf Greenfield and Sachs since 2001, um, focusing mainly on on startup and, and early stage technologies, um, both on the on the university side as well as the startup um, company side. So the the companies that are spinning out of the universities, um, and that's where my focus has always been is on on how do you go from from the lab bench to uh, com commercial commercialization and things of that nature. Um, been involved in a variety of different areas and as far as the technology goes. Um, but my focus on the on the legal side and the patent side has always been on the early stage uh, technologies and, and sort of the issues you run into there. Um, so as I mentioned, you know this is going to be a more of a strategic discussion. I'm happy to entertain any questions. Please feel free to send them to, to Mehmet. Um, we're going to look at, at at patents from a number of different views. So first is the scientist point of view. You know what things look like at the lab bench and what are the things you you typically want to think about. Um, then we'll talk about what happens after that point. Um, the patent gets filed, then what? Um, so that's kind of the, the, the job of the licensing office um, in, in most institutes and universities. Um, once all those patents are filed, the question is, you know, how, how do we start converting this into something that, that forms the basis of a business? Uh, one of the things that the licensing office will be interested in are people who are, in, are, are want to, to start a company. Um, those companies need money. Um, and so investors often will get involved in this discussion and they'll look at these patents and patent applications and, and ask a lot of questions about them. Um, you know, and these might be things that, that, that you might not think about when you're sort of at the bench trying to get something to work and, and thinking just really mostly about what you've invented. Um, th so this is a chance to kind of look at what, what the game looks like from different points of view. And I'll also have a, a, a number of tips to think about and maybe some discussion points and things of that nature. Um, so let's start with the scientist's point of view, you know, the, the Eureka movement, right? You, you, you're in the lab, you've got an invention, it's this thing that works wonderful. Um, you know, you've probably been to some of these talks at, at other universities and institutions where, where they go through and they say, well, here's how you file for a patent application. Right, they'll say things like, um, you know, is it new? Is it not obvious? Is it useful? They'll talk about section 101 and 102 and 103 and all this sort of stuff, right? Not your patent basics 101 talk. Um, if you haven't sat through one of those talks, I highly recommend that you do. Um, but I'm basically distilling all of that to just what's on this slide um, and assuming that you've seen some of this before. Um, you know, we talk about whether there's something that's new, non obvious, is it useful? Um, when we file an application, we're going to the government, the US government or, or other countries, um, and requesting a scope of protection in exchange for giving them information about our invention. Um, the application requires us to describe the invention in a way that someone can get the same results. Um, this is this is commonly referred to as enablement. Um, I tend to refer to it as the reprodu reproducibility standard because it's similar to what you see in, in academia. Um, you know, but, but you go through this process, you get the patent, um, 
that you get these rights that are associated with the patent and that gives you this ability to, to go go to court and, and have the government stop other people from performing whatever it is that's in your your patent and in your claims right so you know again this is what you typically see in your your patent 101 basics talk so you know what happens after that so let's talk about how things look from the licensing office's point of view, right? There's a number of scientists, they're working in their labs, they're working on very innovative, cutting edge stuff. And occasionally somebody comes back to them and says, hey, you know, we have this invention in the lab. Um, you know, let's, this is something that, that we think is new and, and, and no one's ever done it before. Um, and then the licensing office then has to ask the question of, well, what are we gonna do at this point? You know, there's a, there's a lot of inventions. Um, in a lot of cases, you have a lot of people who are inventing things and you can't file on everything that you get. It's just simply too cost prohibitive because the first problem you run into is patent applications are not cheap. Um, you know, rates will vary depending on, on um, where you are in the country and how complicated your invention is. But the ballpark number that you'll hear is $10,000 per application for a well-written one that, that can go the distance. Um, and so, you know, if you have 100 inventions during the course of the year, you know, that's a lot of money that, that you probably don't really have to spend. And so that means that you have to now try to figure out which one of these are the ones you're gonna actually spend money on and which ones you're not. You know, now the other thing to think about is licensing office, their, their job is to, to basically make money for the institution. Um, you know, they're, they're, they, 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 they also have a mission of, of course, of trying to push these things to the, um, to the public, to found companies, et cetera. But, but at the end of the day, one of the metrics that all of these licensing offices have is that they have to make money. Um, it's not the thing where you just kind of spend money willy nilly and, and nothing ever happens. You, you need some return on, on the money that you spent. Um, so how do you do that? Well, you license these um, patent applications to companies. Um, well, you know, that's kind of the first problem is that you, you first have to find a company. Um, if you talk to large companies, they're very big, they're very bu bureaucratic, they're often very reluctant to spend money on these technologies which are coming out of universities because they're early stage and haven't been proven. Um, and so you might end up in a conversation that takes three years of back and forth before they're willing to give you money and at the end of that they might decide, you know what, it's just not that interesting or it's too risky for us. Um, so, so large companies, you know, may not be the best source of revenue for you. Um, you could also go to a startup. You could either found your own startup or maybe there's a small company out there that's been around for a few years and doing something similar. Um, hey, that's great. You know, they're, they're small, they're nimble. They like to see new technologies. They're always looking for that competitive edge and maybe the, the thing you have in the lab is the thing that gives them that edge and they really, really want it. The other problem is, of course, as a startup company, they probably don't have a product and they probably don't have much in the way of money. Um, so you can negotiate all you want from them. There's only so much money you're gonna be able to get from them because they just don't have a lot of money to begin with. Um, you know, so now you can see the source of the problem is like, there's not a lot of great sources for revenue for, for these sort of things. You know, and, and the secret is, is that a lot of these licensing offices end up operating at a loss. Um, out of all the cases that they get, they might get a hundred, um, they might get a hundred of these invention disclosures in, they might file on say, you know, 20 of them, but even those 20 that they file on and they spend the, the, the money for may not, may not get licensed. Um, even if it does get licensed, even if it does go to a company and it goes to a, a startup company or it goes to a larger company, not all the technologies succeed. Sometimes they fail because it was too early or there's just too much uncertainty. Sometimes they fail because a different technology comes along that's you know cheaper, faster and better and basically uh, replaces it. And so um, there's no guarantee that just because you have your patent application filed um, that it's going to become a money winner. Um, you know, another problem you have is, is that where do you, where do you get the money from? Well, if you put, if you put the money up front, so you basically say, um, you know, here, here's this technology that we're going to license to you. Um, you know, we, we want a lot of money up front um, because, you know, we want to cover our losses. We don't know if you're going to be around in a couple of years. You know, well, the problem is, is that, that that's a lot of money you have to spend initially and the licensee has to find that money somewhere and they might not be too willing to do it if the price tag is too high. So if you, if you go to them with a really big price tag, you might discourage them and they might not want you know, to, to get the license from you. you know, well, okay, if you say that and you wanna take the long view, we can say, well, instead of doing that, let's put most of the costs on the back end. So you know, we'll, we'll give them some runway, we'll let them develop their product, start getting some sales, and then we'll sort of ask our money at that point, you know, and then they'll have the money to pay for it because they're selling the product. Um, the problem there, of course, is that a lot of these technologies might not make it or, or market forces might come in and there might be competition and they can't really sell it for that much money. 
you know, and in the meantime, you're running for a couple of years where you're not really making any money um, on the license. And so, you know, that, that creates a problem as well. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, what do you really want from a licensee? Usually they sort of fall into to three buckets. Um, one is the fixed costs, you know, whatever you, if, if you can't get anything else, you want to at least be able to have some money in that, that recoups the legal fees, the overhead, the salaries, things of that nature. Um, you usually put some milestones in there where you're basically pushing licensees to uh, commercialize because, you know, you, you need, you, you, you want them to make money and, and sell a product. Um, and you also want this technology to, to leave the lab and become something that, that, that helps people and, and is commercialized and so forth. Um, and finally, you want, you know, royalties on the product because if they actually get to the point where they clear all the hurdles, they actually sell product, you know, you want some piece of the action, uh, you know, a 1% royalty or whatever percentage of royalty, um, you know, and that's a little bit, it's a little bit like winning the lottery at that point, you know, maybe one or 2% of the cases that, that you file at the beginning from, from all the things that come into your office actually get to the point where you're actually making money on them. Um, and those are, at, at some sense, it's almost a lottery system, uh, you know, when you, when you stop and think about it and all these things that can go wrong. Um, and that's how a lot of these licensing um, offices tend to operate is, is that, you know, it's basically uh, an art of buying lottery tickets and hoping that they succeed and, and trying to pick the winners um, because you just don't know which are, who, who's going to win and you don't know which are the technologies that are going to be successful. Um, you know, a little later on, I'll talk a little bit about what things you might want to do and when you're sort of thinking about this process from the inventor side and, and some of these other points of view. Um, but I can stop there and see if there are any questions before we move on to the, um, to the investors. Uh, I don't see any questions. Please go ahead. Okay. So the investor's point of view. Um, you know, these are the people who are basically interested in, in investing money in companies that are going to license this technology from the, um, you know, licensing office. Uh, and the first thing I often tell people is that if you ever actually try to read a patent application, it's basically an incomprehensible legal document, right? Um, there, there's, a, there's a Supreme Court case from about 100 years ago, which basically said, Patents are, are the most complicated legal documents that are out there because they require not only an immense amount of legal knowledge, they also require an immense amount of scientific or engineering knowledge. And it's those things that have to fit together um, that, that form these patents. And so you read these patents and it's got all this legal mumbo jumbo in there, right? It's got um, Marcuse groups and embodiments and all this sort of stuff. And so the question is, you know, why, are invent why, why do investors actually even care about this? Um, well, you know, they don't, want to read these patents because they have, they need some bedtime reading, you know, the, the, there's a practical thing that they're looking for. And what they're looking for is, you know, does this patent allow me to stop competitors from doing anything? Um, this goes right back to the, the basic fundamental function of a patent, which is, is a, the right to exclude others, to keep other people from doing things. Um, and so they're going to ask questions like, you know, how do I know that, that if I give you this money, um, you know, that this aligns with your business strategy and it's going to stop people from coming into this market space. It's going to stop people from knocking off this product that we're going to develop. Um, is it going to, you know, if people design around what we're trying to, uh, to sell, do we have a way to stop them with these, with these documents? Um, and that's what they're looking for. They're, they're looking at, at patents as a way to protect an investment. Um, and that's really the only thing they care about and the, the only reason they ever read these patents and, and stuff like that. Um, so when they're looking into um, whether I should license it from a company or from a, a university or something like that, um, they'll do what's called due diligence, which is basically stress test the patents um, because they're trying to figure out, is this document going to protect my money and my investment? Um, is it going to create space so that I can have this company develop a product? Um, you know, and so the things that they look for are, you know, they don't care about how much money you spent on the patent. What they want to do is they want to make sure that it can go the distance. Um, and so they'll look at things like, you know, is this, is this a well-written patent application or is this something that was written at the last minute um, and, and therefore could introduce a lot of risk to my investment because as something that was written at the last minute or a cover sheet application or something like that, it might not be able to stop competitors from coming into the space. Um, if they feel like that, that, that these patents put their investment at risk, you know, uh, in, a, in a best case scenario, they might just simply devalue the deal. They'll just say, well, I just create less risk, so I'll give you less money, so I have less risk to my investment. If they think that the patents aren't good enough because they weren't well written in the first place, you know, they might kill the deal. Um, 
So one of the things I, I do in my job is sometimes I represent um, investors um, when they're doing these due diligence projects. So, so you know, we'll be looking at a, a patent application that was filed by another university and, and the investor will be asking me, you know, what do you think about this filing and, you know, how, how reliable is it and is it going to protect the things I needed to protect? And I've answered in some, some instances, yeah, this is not great. Here's all these flaws and here's all the ways that it could go wrong. And I've seen deals get killed just solely on that basis. It just, the investor just felt like there's too much risk um, and they just didn't want to put money in a company where they didn't know that the company would survive if they got into a legal fight. So that's, that's again, something that, that you might not necessarily think about when you're, when you're at the lab um, coming up with a new invention or something like that, that this is where it could end up. Uh, let's see, I can, I can stop there if there are any, any questions and, or I can move on to um, some, some tips about, uh, the, about. Some questions are coming about, in. Okay. Uh, one question is, uh, what do you think is the most efficient way of finding out whether your product idea is new? Um, it's a good question. Um, you know, how do you figure out what well, something is new? Well, you know, what I always tell people to start with is just start with Google. Um, you know, there's the Google website, which everybody knows, um, you know, how to use, and it's got the basic search tools. There's a, there's a sister site called Google Patents. Um, if you can't find it, just type patents into Google and it pops it up. Um, it's run by Google, but it basically searches only the patent databases. Um, and it has a couple of other ni nice searching tools and stuff like that. Um, you know, it's one way to find out whether, you know, both Google and Google Patents are one way just to find out like who, who else is out there doing something similar. Um, usually when you talk to a university, um, you know, licensing office or something like that, they'll ask you those kind of questions. They'll ask, you know, who, who else do you know that's in this field? You know, have you done any searching? You know, do you know if just like scientific publications of, of competitors and things like that? Um, the reason that they're asking that is because those documents often become the keywords for them to start doing searching. So if they know that there's another professor doing something similar, um, they can use that professor and that, that university name in, into a, you know, a Google patents type of database or something like that and, and see what's, what they've been doing on the legal side to see if, you know, how new this invention really is. Um, you know, so there's some things like that, that, that the licensing offices can do where they rely on, on, um, the invest the inventors coming to them um, and asking them, you know, what do you know already about this field, you know, that that would allow us to conclude that this is something we'd want to go forward with. Okay. What is the main difference of provisional patent application and a full patent application in terms of protection of invention? Yeah, another good question, because legally the answer is there isn't a difference. Um, when when you go to the point where you're in litigation, sort of at the end of the day, when when you know when push comes to shove, um, the legal standards by which you evaluate a provisional application and, and in the way and the standard that you evaluate a normal application are exactly the same. Um, and so when a court is looking at, at a provisional application and saying, you know, um, does this do the things that it needs to do? Uh, they don't care about the fact that it's a provisional. They're looking to see, was it written in a way that that explains the invention? So if you remember um, back on, on this slide, they're looking for all the stuff that, that and, and seeing if this stuff was described in the application, you know, does it clearly describe the, the scope of the invention, fulfill the written description requirements, enablement, et cetera. Um, and if they conclude that the answer is no, then they'll basically say that, well, the patent is invalid because it doesn't have the, it doesn't have the priority date or, or it's invalid or prior art or, or what have you, or it's too narrow. Um, and so that's the legal standard. Now, you know, there's a few differences in that provisionals don't get examined and things like that, you know, which is a little bit of a misnomer because they will eventually get examined, especially if you end up in litigation. It's just that they don't get examined initially. Um, and so it kind of marks your place in line so that when you do get examined, you're treated as if you, you know, your regular application was filed at, at that place in line. Um, so, you know, it's, it's often a mistake to, for example, you have a, uh, you have a scientific publication coming out in two days and you're like, well, we don't have time to write an application. We're just going to uh, slap a cover sheet on it and file my, my, um, my, uh, my paper as, as the patent application. Um, if you do that, and a lot of institutes will do that, um, you know, when, when push comes to shove and you look at it, you look at the, all these things that it has to do on the slide and it's basically gonna fail all of them. Um, and then that means that the provisional patent application has very little value at that point. Okay, one question, uh, when would be the best time point to prepare the patent, after the experiment or during, the ex during designing the experiment? Um, from, as a practical matter, probably at least when the experiments are mostly done, 
Um, you know, it does take time to put together a patent application, just like it takes time to uh, prepare a, a scientific publication. Um, if you start the process too early, you don't know if the data will actually support, you know, whatever it is you're trying to, to, to write about, you know, so similar to a scientific paper. Um, you know, so if you start too early, you end up with a, a bit of a wish list and not enough details and not enough of a discussion on how you can do it. You know, so if you look at if you look at the slide on the screen here, where it says someone else can get the same results, right? If you don't know what the results are because you've never done the experiments, you you can't meet this test of of writing it in a way that someone else can get the same results. Um, you know, so those are the things that that typically you know you'd come to you'd, you'd have a new invention and then you'd decide that you probably need a little bit more scientific data first before you can go forward. <clears throat> a similar question. I don't know if you answered. Do you need a proof of concept in the patent? Um, it's not a specific requirement, you know, you, you need to have some level of plausibility, uh, you know, so, you know, when people talk about fully describing the invention or the written description, that, that's basically what they're talking about is, is that, you know, is this written in a way that people can understand what you're doing? Um, you know, the proof of concept is sometimes another way of saying, saying that, you know, it's, it's, there's enough detail there that somebody gets the sense of, you know, what you're doing. You know, and maybe coupled with some data that shows that what you think will work will actually work in practice. Um, it might not necessarily be as comprehensive as you find in a scientific paper, but there's enough there that people believe what you say, you know, in your application because you've described it in a way that somebody can repeat it. How long does it normally take to get a patent? Uh, the normal process is a couple of years. Um, and it's, it's, it's a little bit like getting a scientific uh, paper approved and that there's there's a examiner instead of a reviewer and you go back and forth with them a couple of times it can be two three or four times um, and that typically occurs over a couple of years and you know there's a number of other legal wrinkles but but that's the the typical things like two to four years um, you know that seems like a long time and there are mechanisms that if you're in a rush um, to get it issued faster you can you basically have to pay extra money and they they put you at the head of the line at the patent office um, but that that extra fee to get to the head of the line is a couple of thousand dollars and so it's something that um, you know most institutes won't do unless there's some pressing need of, of why they have to get to the head of the line first i have a question i don't get it but maybe you understand what if not all the inventors are not on the same page about commercialization of an invention yeah that can be that can be difficult. I mean, it's basically a question of you know what are we going to do with the patent and what are we going to do with these ideas, um, especially in the university context. I've had cases where where we've run into that issue where people think it can be different things. Um, and I, I know one case a number of years ago where we 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 had a case like that. And we ended up with something like two hundred and fifty claims in the application, just because we didn't know what was going to go forward. Everybody had these different ideas on on what might make the mo most sense commercially, and the problem is is that at at what we knew at that stage in time, they all sounded good, right? It wasn't like these people were disagreeing with each other because they were trying to be disagreeable. It's just that they all had different visions on, on the best way to move forward. And we basically included all of them in the application. Um, ended up with 250 claims. Um, that, that company, act, we actually launched a company based on that, actually, actually a number of companies. But the first one that launched ended up, the winner ended up being claim number 223 or something like that, um, you know. At, those of us in the room who were writing this thing and putting together this claim, we had no idea which was going to be the, the most commercially valuable one. So we just basically guessed as many guesses as we could. And it was two, number 223 that ended up being the winner. I see. Uh, can patents be updated in order to close loops from previous versions of the disclosure? Uh, generally speaking, no. Um, once you once you submit the patent application to the patent office, it's it's final. Um, whatever information you have on the date that you gave to the patent office is the date that information gets. Um, if you have additional information later on, um, most of the time you can't really go back to the patent office and say, "Oh, this this information I gave you the first time around, it's incorrect." Um, you know, here's the correct version or something like that. Um, there are a couple of caveats to that, which which I you know probably don't really have time to go into today, but the but the general take home message is is that you know once you give it to the patent office, you should assume that it's final and and that you don't want to make any changes. So that's why it's important to to get it right the first time. Well, you can do addendums, or I, I see when I Google you know patent search, I see addendums or some other thing filed with the same title three years later. That's a separate patent. It's it might be a continuation application. So. 
So one of the things that can happen, if you remember, I was referring back to this case with 223 claims, right? If you're the examiner receiving this thing, you're going to be like, I don't really want to look at that many claims. That's a lot of stuff I have to look at. Um, and so there's a bunch of procedural mechanisms that allow the patent examiner to break up your patent into multiple cases. Um, and then you can pursue each one of them individually. So each one might be, so you might have a case that's broken up and then you end up with a patent that has um, maybe 15 claims in it. Right, and then you pursue those with the patent office. Um, you convince the examiner to allow them, and at that point, you can go back and 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 file an another patent. It's going to look identical to the first one, but it's going to go after a different set of claims, right? Because there's now 235 claims left that you still have available. Um, you know, they can't deny that to you. So you know, you go back and you, you go for for a second generation patent. Um, uh, you know, with a different set of claims, but otherwise the specification looks identical. Um, and you can repeat this, you know, as many times as you want until you get through all the claims or you, you know, run out of money. Um, and, you know, I have one case right now, we're on the 14th generation. So, um, yeah, th that's why you often will see that. They'll just, they'll, they'll look very similar to each other, but they're actually different patents. I see. Is the, are the provisional patents final or can they be amended with more claims? Um, so, so provisional patents last one year, um, and then they expire automatically. Uh, you know, you, there isn't really a procedure to, to change provisional cases, um, but what you can do, and what I've done in a number of cases, is file file additional provisional patents um, because the filing fees aren't expensive. And so, during that first year, if you you get some new updates and you don't want to, you know, you you want to you want to make sure you you claim those as well, you file what you file an updated provisional application. Um, and sometimes you file two or three of them uh, during the course of the year. And at the end of that, that one year period, um, you'll file your next application, you know, typically a PCT application, and then you claim all the, all the rights to all the other provisionals as well. So they all get, they, they get grouped together and, and you keep them all, all intact. Uh, is it worthwhile uh, to file a provisional patent every time you file a patent? Um, every time you invent something? <laughs> Yeah. No, no. I yeah. think the process is you do provisional one year later, you convert to a patent. But is it yep. worthwhile to do this process or can you directly just do patent, ignore the provisional part? Um, you, can, you, you can. And I actually have a few clients which, which did that for, for various business reasons. They wanted things to move a little bit faster. Um, so they would. Um, so they would they would file a. Uh, they would, they, would file the, they would file it just directly as a non-provisional application, just a regular utility application, um, you know, and that, that gets the examination process going a little bit faster. But it's a business decision. It's not really a, you know, there's not really a legal right or wrong. It's really a business decision on, on whether you want to do that or you want to sort of try to save your money until later. Nice. Would you recommend to license a patent that might not cover area as well, but investors file more patents to extend the application and market? Um, sorry, I didn't quite understand that. I think the pattern, okay, let me repeat again. Would you recommend to license a patent that might not cover area as well, but investors uh, file more patents to extend the application and then uh, try again? Yeah, so I think, I think the question is, 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 is that if, if, if you're an investor and you're, light, and you're interested in licensing a patent and it doesn't cover you know, everything you need it to cover, you know, does it make sense or not? Um, it's so hard both to answer. sides, from an investor point and from a you know inventor point. Yeah, from the investor point of view, you know, it really comes down to that question of of business risk. Um, you know, it's like, well, if you if you invest money in the company and in the, in these patents and stuff like that, um, is is it something where where at some point I'm going to get my money back and and hope to make a profit out of it because there's a company that's founded and it's and it and it, and it's doing the right things. Um, you know, when it's going to go forward and, and I think I'm, you know, that this is a wise investment to make in this company, in this business. Um, I have seen cases where, yeah, the patents weren't that great, but the, um, the founding team was really, really strong. They had a great business model. Um, you know, they had protection in some areas, even though it wasn't perfect. And it was, it's, it's a bet, right? You, you know, there's, there's some risk there, but it was a, 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 a bet that they were willing to take and, you know, it, it proved to be relatively successful. You know, I've seen other ones where people just look at that 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 bet and they're like, "Yeah, I'm not taking that because it's too risky for me." Um, you know, and that that's really how how they look at it. They don't really look at it as you know what exactly the scope of protection is. They really boil down into, you know, is this risk something I can handle? Can you file a patent after presenting the it in a scientific meeting? Um, generally speaking, no. Um, so if you look at, at the rest of the world, you know, again, this is something that, 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 
folks who've seen the patent 101 type of talk, you know, um, there's multiple patent uh, jurisdictions around the world because each patent is controlled by its respective government. And, and other than the US, pretty much every country in the world has what's called the absolute novelty standard, um, which is as soon as that information is somewhere in the public domain, it is no longer patentable. It is not an invention. People know about it already. And therefore, as, since it's not an invention, it has no patent rights. So if you go to a scientific conference and you tell just one other person there, that information is considered to be in the public domain. And, and you know, at that point, you can't really file a patent on it. The US a number of years ago adopted a pretty similar rule. There's a little bit of a grace period, um, but, but a couple number of years ago when they passed this rule, they changed it from the old standard of a, a one year grace period, which was, which was you know, really nice. Um, when I counsel my clients, I tell people like, yeah, if you only care about the US market and you don't care about any other market, yeah, then yeah, you can rely on this grace period. But you know, in, in this day where everything's multinational and global, almost nobody has ever said that we don't care about European markets, we don't care about China, we don't care about Japan, right? And then I was like, well, if that's the case, then you have to use the standard that's the most strict, which is that you, you assume that, that as soon as you disclose this information, um, you, know, you run into trouble because you can't file patents on it and you have to make steps and have policies that, that keep you from getting into those problems. See, can you request a different examiner? It sounds as if the person reviewing your application at the patent office is more dangerous than any study panel. <laughs> that's a good question. I've only successfully done this once and it's something that's very difficult to do um, is to get a new examiner. Now what you can do and what the normal process is is that you can, uh, you, 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 you can appeal, which is basically go to a higher level within the patent office. Um, and there's this, this sort of this appeals process that you can that can involve you have a stubborn examiner, um, but it costs a lot of money and a lot of people don't like to do that, um, you know. But that is the that is the process by which you can try to overturn an examiner's to go 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 up the food chain. Um, having said that, there are some mechanisms available that I said you know is used sparingly by which you can get an examiner change, but it really depends on the facts and circumstances and you know what kind of rejections the examiner is making. Um, the ones that are the most successful are the ones where you can clearly show the examiner is doing things that, that just don't make any, any logical sense from a legal point of view. Um, if it's a scientific question about, well, document A teaches something and, and the examiner said, you know, and, and you say, well, no, the examiner, you know, is wrong. It doesn't teach that thing. That, that's a scientific question. That's very difficult to overturn a, an examiner on. You, know, you, you end up having to work up the appeal chain instead. Okay. What does the investors like to see? The full PCT, provisional, or granted application? Um, depends on the investor. Um, the ones who have been, you know, doing this for a long time understand the patent application process. Um, so they typically will just ask for whatever the latest round of documents is, and then they'll have their patent attorneys basically dig up the entire file history and read it, you know, and kind of read it and figure out, you know, what are the, what are the problems that we should be aware of. Um, so all they really want from you is just some sort of, uh, you know, some guidance on where to start looking and then they'll have their patent and um, ex uh, their patent lawyers kind of do the rest of it. Um, you know, so when, you, you, so when I'm on the other side and I'm sort of, um, you know, representing a university or something like that, you know, basically my, my philosophy is to hold nothing back because if you try to hold anything back, if they have patent, smart patent lawyers on the other side, they'll still get all that information anyway. So all you really end up doing is just creating a lot of friction where you don't need it. And they're gonna get the information one way or the other. So you might as well just give it to them and be as transparent as possible. Okay. What if the patent is in conflict with the publication of results in a scientific journals? How do you deal with this? <laughs> That's a tough one because um, you know, if you end up in a situation where you're in litigation about that, that almost invariably will get used against you. It's like, well, you, you, you're saying, you know, you're saying A on this side and B on the other side and A and B are in conflict with each other. Please explain that, right? Um, yeah. Hopefully you have a good answer to that question. Uh, you know, sometimes it's a situation where um, A is broader than B and they're not actually in conflict with each other. It's just that you chose different um, priorities when you wrote these two documents and, you know, you can explain that and it's pretty straightforward. If, if it is scientifically a problem, and you know, there's a couple of, 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 um, of uh, court cases where, where that, that's actually happened is that a patent was invalidated because the scientific paper that the inventors published subsequently to that showed that that patent couldn't have worked. Um, you know, and so that, 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 that was basically irrefutable scientific evidence that the patent itself was invalid and, and should have never been filed. And that was grounds to invalidate the patent. Okay, can we withdraw the provisional patent before one year to prevent public Publish, being publicized. If you have a process that should be a trade secret, how can we protect it with patenting? Yeah. 
So provisional applications, you, you can't withdraw them, but on the other hand, they don't ever get published um, within that one year period that, they, that they're impending. So um, if, if you file a provisional application and then you decide you didn't want to file it in the first place and you do absolutely nothing else, at the one year date, the provisional automatically expires. Now, what can happen is that at the end of that one year date, you say, hey, you know, we want to keep going. So you file your next application like a PCT application. Um, you know, and at that point, when the PCT application publishes, not only did the application itself publish, they publish all the legal documents that are related to that application, which includes the provisionals. And that's at the point where the provisionals um, see the light of day. Uh, that typically occurs 18 months after you file the provisional, right? So the provisional expires at 12 months. So you have to do something for that next six months to keep it going. And that's the typically, typically the PCT application. Um, so, so at that point, yeah, your provisionals become public, but if you decide you don't want that to happen, you know, and I've had this a number of, of times, you know, you just simply just ignore it. You wait for the provisional to expire. And then because it's expired and nothing claims priority to it, it never publishes and it stays confidential. Okay. Um, in regards to the trade secret question, you know, I've, I've had a few si similar situations where we weren't sure if we wanted to protect it by, by patents or trade secret, right? Um, you know, so we filed a provisional application and it's, that basically bought us an extra year of time to figure out which way we wanted to go. At the end of that one year date, if you wanted to protect it by the patent route, you just simply file a PCT application and you go forward that way. If you decide you want to go the trade secret route, you, you do nothing, you let the provisionals expire there's no publication and therefore it's still protectable as a trade secret. So that's kind of one way to sort of just, you know, um, buy a little bit of time to figure out which way you want to go. Once you get past the publication date though, you know, you're, you're pretty much done because all of that information is now available to the public and then it's no longer, you know, trade secret. So you do have to have a decision, but at least it gives you an extra year to, uh, to make up your mind. Okay. One advantage of provisional patent uh, might be first to file and give us time to complete the experiments and file more comprehensive patents. Do you see any disadvantage in provisional patent? Um, yeah, it's the, it's, the same, it's the same issue in that, that you know, the, the provisional, you know, I've certainly done that a number of times, um, but you still have to have enough information in the provisional application that, that you meet these various requirements as, as I have on the slide here. Um, so if it's, if it's filed in too much of a rush and you end up like not, not listing all of these things or describing them in enough detail, um, you know, then you think you're protected, but your provisional application may not, not, be, uh, not, not give you the scope of protection that you think it, it's going to give you. And, and that, therefore you're at risk at that point. Um, so you have to be really careful when you use provisional applications that, that, you're, um, you know, that, that you're not taking shortcuts in terms of knowledge that has to be in the application. Um, that, that's something you really don't, don't have a lot of uh, flexibility on. And what you really have flexibility on are more like formatting issues or, or things of that nature. Interesting question. Is there a copyright for patents? Can we cut and paste from other patents and submit a new patent? <laughs> that's a good question. The answer is no, they're government documents. Um, <laughs> and, and the US government doesn't get copyrights in, in, in official government documents. So um, that information is typically not, not copyrighted. In theory, you can copy and paste things out of other patent applications and put them in yours. Um, in practice, it's a bad idea to do that that because the, the application you're copying and pasting it from might have a completely different purpose. Um, and the same terms get used very differently in different patent applications. Um, so one extreme example for that is, for example, is the word plasma, right? You know, in some sense, plasma might be referring to blood plasma. In another sense, it might be refers to ionized gas. And if you're copying it from the wrong application and they were using plasma to mean ionized gas, and you're using it in the context of, of blood transfusions, right? You're copying stuff that really doesn't belong in your application and that can make a huge mess. So yeah, in theory, you can do it in practice. It's not wise to do that. Um, what, what, what is the criteria that modifies the cost of a patent? Um, so I would say there's sort of two basic things that, that go into it, sort of two orthogonal dimensions. So number one is the complexity of the technology. You know, when, when we talk about how you describe the invention, uh, you know, you can have some, a very, very simple invention. So you have something that's basically a new and improved doorstop, right? Or you can have something very complicated, you know, CRISPR technology. Um, it's going to take a lot more time and cost a lot more money to describe how the CRISPR technology works than it is going to, to, to explain how a doorstop works. So if you're dealing with an invention that involves CRISPR technology, you're going to expect a lot more money that you would need to spend in order to, to do that sort of thing. 
Um, the other dimension is, is in a sense, like how much is it worth to you? Um, you know, there, there's, there's patent lawyers around the country. They come in different ex experiences and billing rates and things of that nature. Um, you know, and some people don't want to spend a lot of money on patent applications and other people want to spend a lot of money on patent applications. Um, you know, and patent lawyers, just like everything else in our economy, are, are affected by the laws of supply and demand. Um, so some people just, they want to spend as little money as possible and they're willing to have a cheap patent lawyer write their patent applications and other people, you know, want high quality work and then they'll hire an expensive patent lawyer to write their applications. And, and that will affect the cost at the end of the day. And, and in my experience, those are kind of the two biggest variables when it comes down to how much patent applications cost. Um, you know, the market, the, the market rate, at least in the Boston area, is usually around $10,000 to $15,000, but that's just the, the median number, and it's not hard to find, you know, a $5,000 patent application and a, and a $20,000 patent application just in the Boston area. Um, the, the rest of the country, I'm sure, you know, follows the same sort of laws of supply and demand. Okay. If a patent is filed in USA, how easy people out of USA can copy it and file it out of USA? Can we protect it? Um, yeah, so that's that has to do with the, the the whole thing about the patent cooperation treaty. So you know, in theory, um, you only get protection for for the, um, the the the, uh, the the countries in which you've applied for that patent for. Um, typically, you file it first in the U.S. as a provisional application and what have you. Um, after a year, you typically go file a PCT application where you have an option to pursue your patent in other jurisdictions around the world. Um, that typically lasts. Um, another year and a half on top of the provisional. So, so two and a half years or 30 months total. And at that point you have to decide which countries you want protection in, um, you know, and so people like, like most popular countries are, are the US, Europe, China, and Japan. Um, if you want protection in those countries, you have to apply for rights in those countries with that patent application within that 30 month time frame. Um, you know, and then you pursue the application in, in each of their patent offices. Um, and, and hopefully they allow you to, you know, they, they, they issue a patent in, in those jurisdictions. Um, so let's say you do that, you know, and you, you have your, your technology and you file it and you give it to um, the Chinese patent office, the Japanese one, the European one, and the US one, um, you know, and they all issue patents on it. Well, great, now you're protected in those countries, but somebody can make the invention in India and sell it in India, and then you would have no way of stopping them because patents are only as good as the country that issued them in the first place. And, you know, the US and China have no jurisdiction inside India. Um, so that can be a pretty big decision as to, as to where you, you want to get protection for, you know, there's uh, 150 plus countries around the world. And if you wanted to file patents in every single one of those countries, it would be horrendously expensive. So you have to learn to pick your battles and, and figure out which jurisdictions are most interesting commercially. Okay. Uh, if you want to commercialize a biomedical product, FDA has multiple layers and it may take longer, etc. If you want to file a biometrial based medical application patent, would the time scale of getting the patent change or does it depend on how crowded the area is? Um, it's, as far as the patent office itself is concerned, the timeline is exactly the same. They don't really make a distinction about these things. They get the inventions in, they, yeah, certainly it's a biotech case or it's a pharmaceutical compound or what have you, right? They treat them all the same way. The patent office doesn't really make a distinction. Um, now, what makes the distinction is, is the FDA and, and, and their approval process. And then there's some, there's, there's, there's a mechanism that allows you to get some time back on the clock um, for, for time spent in regulatory approval. So FDA, Department of Agriculture, and a couple of other ones. Uh, and most other countries around the world have a similar system. So, you know, there are ways to get, get some of the time back on the clock if you have to spend time getting your, your, your invention for, F, you know, your, your technology based on the invention through, through the FDA as well. Um, you know, that, that's a complicated discussion. I could easily spend an hour talking about, about patent term extension and things of that nature. But in general, yeah, there, there is an extension mechanism that, that, you, that is available for FDA, a, a FDA approval. Well, that's all the questions I have for now. Maybe you can continue. <laughs> okay, and yeah, no, a lot of good questions. I'm glad to see that everyone's really engaged in, in, in these topics. Um, so, so the next part of the talk was really just some tips 
to think about, you know, and, and remember, these are tips. They're not like, you know, you have to do it this way and, and every situation is going to be different. And that's why, you know, you, you typically want to get legal advice on stuff like this. But here's a couple of tips to think about. Um, the first one, and I think there are a couple of questions along this line is, you know, file before you disclose, because once that information is out there in the public domain and, and members of the public have access to it, there's basically no way to get it back. Um, you know, as we discussed, the U.S. has has some ability to, to keep that from happening, a little bit of a grace period, but it's not as extensive as it used to be. And so you have to be very, very careful about that and, and, and assume that um, whatever the idea you have is that, that you have to have something on file before you start disclosing it. Um, another thing to think about that's important is, is, you know, from my point of view, and you've seen about investors and how licensing offices look at this, these are business tools. You know, these are not things that are intended to be put on a resume and you just simply count how many patents you have on your resume and, and things of that nature. You know, they're very expensive. Um, there's a lot of complications here on, on the legal side of things. And that's because they're, they're meant to be business and commercial tools and, and help uh, propel technologies out of the lab and in, into, into the commercialization um, arena. Uh, so just simply filing a patent for the sake of filing a patent, you know, most universities will do that from time to time. Um, but they typically try to discourage that because they're just throwing money away and, you know, obviously they don't really want to do that more than they have to. Uh, another thing to do is just get involved in these business discussions. You know, if you're listening to this seminar, I, I assume it's something that, you, you know, you have some interest in and, you know, how, how these things work when, when people talk about patents and, and that sort of thing. Um, these are things that they're looking at, you know ask the question, how will this invention actually help someone make money? You know, is it going to, is it going to help cure people of some disease and therefore they'd be willing to spend money on that? You know, is this going to be a new product that, that people would want to buy as consumers? You know, what have you? Sometimes uh, there's a number of different opportunities, but it's important to just think about not just how does this work and how do we get a scientific paper, but you know, how are we going to help people and how are we going to make money on, on this? Um, one of the one of the things that a lot of scientists have trouble with initially is is that they, they they focus too much on the thing they actually invented, and they don't think about well how can I get around it or how how could I do this thing I invented in a somewhat different way, um, you know can I use different reagents instead of uh you know the reagents I used to run this experiment if I used uh for example hydrochloric acid to to change the pH, well somebody who wants to do it slightly differently might use nitric acid or might use sulfuric acid. Um, you know, so those are the kind of questions that, 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 that we're thinking about, even on a scientific side, because that, that might help identify new areas of research for you. But on the business side, these are the questions that, that investors and licensing offices are, are interested in because they want to understand, you know, what people will do once they learn about this technology. Um, you know, similarly with uh, workarounds, potential applications and markets. Um, one other thing is, is that if you can identify your, your technology as being more of a platform technology, um, so that, that it's this basic idea, but it could be commercialized and exploited in a number of different ways, you know, licensing offices and investors really like that because they, they see it as multiple shots on goal, right? If you have this technology and it could be used, for example, it could be used in, in the dental industry and it could be used in, in repairing cars and it could be used um, to, to make home appliances. Well, that's three different markets that you have um, have the ability to sell this patent, and that get, that means you have three times as many opportunities, and and hopefully one of them will succeed. If you only have a niche thing, and you know, I actually had a, a phone call this morning with a with a with with with, with a with a person who's basically just looking at um, having this invention in and selling it to one Fortune 500 company in that that's out there, and I'm like. If they say no, what are you going to do then, right? You you literally have one customer, and if they say no, you're done, right? You know, it's like, is that really the business model that you want? And they're like, well, maybe we should think about other people who might want to buy this technology that we invented, right? So you know, that's the kind of thing that makes it much more attractive and 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 you know, interesting to to people who want to commercialize and help this technology move forward. Um, you know, one thing I always say in these kind of talks is, if you don't remember anything else I've said, just remember that you have to file the patent application before you disclose anything. So I can I can stop there after I think I saw a few more yeah, questions. Yeah, there's a couple in. of things that related came in. Um, is mentioning the IP in a pitch competition uh, means uh, you're, you're disclosing it? Um, it, it gen generally speaking, yes. You know, if you're if you're describing your your technology. Um, in a pitch competition, then that means people know what you're doing, right? And that, that's giving away the invention. Um, oftentimes, you know, because you can't really go to, you know, you, you, if you go to a pitch competition and say, yeah, we invented this thing and we're not going to tell you what it is, of course, you're, you're probably not going to win the pitch competition. 
Um, so yeah, you have to be really careful when you know you you have one of two choices. One is that you file before you go to the pitch competition, and I've certainly done that in a number of occasions where where you file something, just so you've got that date before the uh, the presentation occurs, you know. And the other is during the pitch competition, you say as little as possible about the actual how it works, you know. In reality, in most pitch competitions, you know, you, you don't really want to bore the audience with the details of how a reacts to B, reacts to C kind of stuff. Really, it's more like, what is the vision that this is? So I have this technology, it's gonna cure cancer, it's based on this protein in general, um, and here's all the wonderful things that'll do, right? You don't actually explain what the modifications to the protein were because those are the details that nobody wants to listen to in a minute and a half pitch, pitch that you're giving. Um, you know, so sometimes you can avoid the issues that way by just saying it at a very high level and getting people excited about what the market opportunity is and, and kind of skipping through the science. So an idea. Imagine you're a small company. You invented something and started, and a big company wants to file, wants to make your patent like uh, illegal. So who who watches whether you presented something and your patent is illegal? Is there a committee, or what? The opposing big company is gonna check whether the patent is illegal. How does that work? Yeah, it's it's basically a form of patent litigation. Um, and it's not illegal, it's actually invalidated is the, is the actual term. And so, you know, if you have a patent that, that issue, there's a number of different court mechanisms that a company can file to try to, uh, to have a court declare that the patent is, in, is invalid. You know, it can be invalid because of, for example, just scientific evidence that's out there or, you know, various other reasons. Um, there's a number of ways they can, they can try to oppose the patent and, and declare it invalid. Um, what happens in reality is that that's, that's, that's actually pretty rare. You know, it, it, it makes the news and, you know, a couple, you know during, uh, during the year you see a number of, of patents where that, that's happened to, but it's actually pretty rare. Um, what most companies are really out for is leverage, right? They don't want to go all the way through this process. They'll, they'll threaten that they will, but what they really want is some sort of negotiated settlement um, because they don't really want to spend the costs and they just want to, you know, get, get a business conclusion of some sort. Um, and that's the thing you have to watch out for because, you know, they might, you know, if you have this wonderful patent and they come to you and say, we think your patent is invalid because of this, this thing that somebody did 20 years before you filed, right? And, and you look at their, their fact thing and it's, it's ironclad argument and just for, for whatever reason, nobody knew about this thing, but they found it, right? You know, they don't have to declare the patent invalid at the point. They don't have to go through the court proceedings. You know, they, they know that they have leverage over you and, and they can pretty much decide what, what you know, you know what they want to do with you at that point, um, and that's when that happens. And in, 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 in more often than not, is, is that you end up with negotiated settlements um, about what to do with these sort of patent issues rather than the actual court battle. Okay, a comment and a question. Great presentation, excellent speaker with clarity over a complicated area. Oh, thank you. <laughs> How much do investors normally pay for patents? Um, Again, it depends on it, on on their business interests on there, you know. Um, so, for example, as I said, I, I sometimes work for um, for investors that are looking at patents, and oftentimes the amount of money that they're willing to pay me to start, you know, kind of kicking the tires on this stuff is a function of how much money they think they want to invest in the company. Um, there's some where it's just like the investment is really small. It was like you know, um, very early stage rounds and you know, the total investment was say $300,000, right? They might not want to spend more than $3,000 of my time on this because they just don't think it's that much of an exposure to them. You know, on the other hand, if it's something where the investment cost is, is going to be, you know, a hundred million dollars. Yeah. They would easily spend a million dollars on, on diligence on something like that. And I've seen that happen before as well. Um, so you'll see numbers all over the spectrum and it's a function of, of what the business risk to the investor is. Okay. Maybe you can continue to uh, wrap up. Uh, or, yep. Yeah. How much time? Yep. So, so licensing tips, you know. Um, so one of the things that licensing offices have to deal with is, you know, how do you stretch the budget, right? As I said, there's a, there's a lot of inventions that come in and oftentimes it will be, um, it will be more inventions than you actually, you can actually pay for. And so you basically have one of two fundamental kind of philosophies. One of them is, is that, you file a lot of cases at low cost, but also low quality because you're just not going to spend a lot of money on each one, you know, or you file a few cases of, of higher quality, um, you know, but you can lose opportunities because you're not filing on everything that you're getting in from, from the, the researchers. Um, you know, the thing that I always tell people is, is that you get what you pay for. Um, if you're filing a lot of cases at low cost, it'll be a lot harder to license them because they're just not well written and, and investors will see right through that. Um, you know, if you want to file cases of, of high quality, yeah, they're going to survive the distance. Investors will be happy because they'll be much, much better at protecting 
the things that they need to protect. Um, but you know, because you have this risk of losing opportunities, you have to be very wise about which ones you, you go forward on and which ones you don't. You know, and if you talk to people who, who've been doing licensing for a while, they'll always tell you about the one that got away, the one that they thought that was never gonna be a good opportunity and it turned out that it would have been and had they only filed the patent application on it, it would have been a very different picture. But that's the price you pay because you know you can't file everything that 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 it comes into the office. Um, from my point of view, and and from the uh, the point of view, if you're thinking about this from from a uh, you know a science or a researcher, um, it, is to think about it as as a little bit of an advertisement. Um, you know, this is something that you probably don't see in your standard patent 101 type of talk. Um, but fundamentally, a patent you know has no value if it doesn't get licensed. Um, and so the question is not only what did you invent, but you know what is the vision for this thing? Yeah, uh, you know, is this something that you envision this is going to be something that's used in a, in a, in certain type of products? And if so, what do those products look like? Um, you know, maybe you want to have some discussion about that in your patent application. You know, who's going to be the, the people who are going to buy this and what are they going to be interested in? You know, because the patent application is not just read by the patent lawyers and by the patent office, it's going to be read by the, the licensing office, it's going to be read by investors, it's going to be read by potential partners and things of that nature. And so if they don't see these things in the patent application because it wasn't well written or because you just didn't talk about it, you know, they, they just won't see where the value of it is. Um, you know, another thing to keep in mind is, is patents, you know, require a certain level of strategic planning. Um, if your if 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 your licensing office is pretty much a you know react to whatever whatever you're given and and try to keep things from falling apart yeah you can do that um, but it's not it's not very strategic it's basically reacting to what happens to show up at your door and you know putting out the fire at the moment um, you can end up with inadequate protection very spotty kind of things and so sometimes it's important you know in the licensing office to think strategically about you know, where, where are the things that, that if people did research in this area would improve the quality of this, this portfolio of cases I'm trying to license to somebody? Or, you know, if I have this particular uh, disease that I'm trying to, um, that, that I have these potential solutions for, you know, can we fill in the gaps here and maybe have a few additional filings um, that would really make this a, an attractive portfolio for somebody? Um, you know, and those are the kind of things that you, you generally want to build into your patent applications, um, predicting what competitors will do, um, offering flexibility, you know, platform strategies, things of that nature, um, you know, and, and discussing that with the researchers and seeing if, you know, they can come up with ideas or maybe they can do some research in the lab to, to kind of fill in these pieces. Uh, Nemet, any uh, questions on that? Uh, not on this one, no. Okay. And then for investors, you know, this is this is an interesting slide because, um, you know, it's really it's really what the investors tend tend to want to see, um, you know. And it's not if you look at this, you know, we'll go through all the details, but but a lot of it actually not not very much of it has to do with the patents themselves. You know, as I said, the patents are the investors look at patents as kind of a way to protect their their investment, but that's not the thing that they focus on. Um, you know, I, I like to think patents are the most important thing in the business, but I, I know that's not actually true. From the investor point of view, what they're really interested in is what 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 the founding team or the, the, the scientist and, and whatever, um, you know, how do they look at the world and how do they look at the business going forward? Um, you know, and that's the thing that they first look at. And then they look at, well, does that, is that actually reflected by the patents and with, and with the IP? So they're looking at things like, you know, does the discussion in the patents match what they have in the pitch deck or what the licensing office has told me they think the the commercialization potential for this thing is, um, you know, are the IP lawyers actually, you know, involved in all of this and, and trying to write patents and claims in a way that protects the business strategy? Or are they just kind of being brought in at the last moment? They just kind of do what they're told and they have no strategic sort of operation. Um, and they're just, just trying to keep everything running. Um, you know, do, do, do the people who actually are thinking about commercialization, do they know the difference between patentability and freedom to operate? You know, again, that's, that's something that would be you typically talk about a patents 101 course, um, but it's something if you're confusing those kind of issues, it, it signals that you don't understand the business very well, um, and that's that's kind of a, a major turnoff for an investor. Um, you know, do the, do the people who are trying to start this company do they know who the competitors are, and you know what are they up to? You know, um, is this something where the these competitors are in a very similar area and they're going to have their own patents that are going to create problems, or is it just something that? Um, yeah, they have, they, they're doing something similar, but their technology is just significantly inferior to ours and therefore they're not much of a risk. Um, you know, are these, are, are these sort of ideas, these technologies, roadblocks, et cetera, you know, are these things that are built into their patent strategy and into their filings? 
you know, and, and finally, are there, are there multiple opportunities for success? You know, whether it's different types of claims, is it a platform technology? Is it something that, um, you know, if, if one route to commercialization might fail, are there other alternatives we can use and, and still get to commercialization a different way using a different technology or a different market or something like that? Um, you know, and those are the kind of things when they read through patents, that's the things, these are things they really care about. They don't really care as much about the details of, you know, how the enzyme works or which acid you use or, or something like that. So yeah, any no uh, questions. questions on that? No, okay. No, All right. Well, just uh, conclude, you know, with, with some of the takeaways. And, you know, one of the things I, I wanted to emphasize on, on today's talk is, is that Patents really are, are business tools and they're, they're about protecting investments and creating barriers of entry to, for competitors. Um, you know, and they're an integral part of a business strategy and, and you know, whether you're an investor or you're a, um, a, a licensing officer or, or, or a scientist, you know, these, these, are thing, these are things that you think about when you look at the patents um, and, and how they're actually used and how they're negotiated and how they become the foundation for companies. It's, you know, it's creating these barriers to entry. Um, you know, patents have many technical and legal requirements, which I've pretty much glossed over today. Um, you know, again, make sure you, you patent before you disclose anything publicly. Um, there's a lot of different people who are going to be reading these patents and saying, you know, is this something I want to put money in and start a business? Or is this something that I want to license from a university because this will help my business grow? You know, and those are the things that determine whether patents are successful or not successful. Uh, you know, finally, I just want to just mention, of course, that these slides aren't legal advice. Um, you know, for whatever your particular situation is, um, you know, you should you should contact an IP lawyer um, and, and get really good advice just in, in, you know, someone who understands not only the scientific details of how it works, but they also understand the, the, the legal, um, the law and, and how these things work legally and as well as the business climate and how do you how do you use these things to further your business. Um, happy to take any questions. I think the next slide here just has my contact info in there, but happy to get, take any questions now, or if you want to email me, I'm happy to respond. So I think, um, thank you very much, Tanya. I think for the interest of time, maybe we can have um, other people um, email you. There's, obviously, there's, this has generated um, so much interest, and um, you know, I'm personally very um, thankful, and I'm hoping that we can uh, have you uh, give more of these very uh, enlightening uh, talks um, shortly. So thank you very, very much. Mehmet, um, other comments? No, it's an excellent talk, excellent talk. I had one final question before I let you. Excellent talk, so many questions. What areas World Patent Office Protection bring? Is it, does it cover the entire world or you have to apply country by country? That's the final question I have. Yep, um, country by country. Okay. E each country has their own patent office that you have to deal with. So what does World, World Patent Office mean then? It's an option that allows you the right to delay the process by which you go to each of these countries. So, so, so there's an earlier treaty known as the Paris Treaty that basically says you have to go within one year. The PCT, it stands for Patent Cooperation Treaty, was an agreement by these different countries that will extend the deadline from one year to 30 months, two and a half years. But if and only if you go through this special procedure, which is this, this PCT application procedure, um, and that's what you typically see these PCT applications, which which go through this this procedure that that allows you to extend the deadline. But that's really all it does. There's no rights in any of this. It just simply pushes the deadlines out. All right. Well, again, thank you so much. I don't want to take more of your time. I appreciate it. Was a fantastic interactive talk. Yep. Thank you, and and thanks for inviting me to to give this talk. Thank you, Tony. <laughs>